All right. Well, good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants event. My name is Joe Grabowski, and I'll be your host for today. Really exciting to see groups starting to join us live via YouTube. Normally, we'd be broadcasting these events live to classrooms across North America and beyond, which is why it's pretty awesome that we're able to continue doing them, but this time, broadcast them right into the homes of parents, of educators, uh, and of students across North America. So we're really excited for today's event. Today, we're excited to be joined by Sven Lindblad and Kristen Hederman, who have traveled the world, exploring the ocean and working to protect it for future generations. So they believe that truly experiencing the ocean can lead to meaningful activism uh, and conservation. So Sven spent six years in East Africa, photographing elephants and wildlife in Kenya and assisting filmmakers on a documentary on the destruction of the African rainforest. This early exposure to nature and wildlife taught him the importance of maintaining natural resources and understanding the cultural background of remote regions around the world. In 1979, he launched Lindblad Expeditions, a unique travel company aimed at offering marine-based expeditions aboard small ships for adventurous travelers. Kristen is recognized for her underwater and adventure travel photography and creating awareness for important environmental and social issues. Based between Maui and Manhattan, her work and travels have taken her on adventures around the world with a keen eye toward ocean conservation and distant cultures. Kristen contributes to publications including Scientific American, Newsweek, and Virgin, and is an ambassador to the oceanic, global, and beneath the waves. All right. Well, Sven and Kristen, it's so great to have you joining us live today. We're excited to get to know you a little bit better and, of course, fire away with a little Q&A action. Thank you for having us. Thank you, Joe. All right. Well, I think the best thing that we can do is start off a little bit. Maybe if each one of you wants to talk a little bit about maybe when you fell hard for the ocean, when was the time that, that you knew it was something you wanted to spend a lot of time around and protecting? No, I want you to go first. Um, well, I've always loved being close to the ocean. It's been a, a place that has always called me home. In fact, where we are right now um, in this quarantine, um, we're on the coast of South Carolina in a place called Isle of Palms. And this is a, a place that I know very well. And I spent many, many years in my 20s walking the beaches here, photographing dolphins on the horizon at sunset. And, um, and then when I moved to Maui, I, I had the opportunity to really um, do a lot more immersion in the water, became a kite surfer, a free diver. And then when Sven and I met, we started diving the world's oceans together. And it was truly when I started scuba diving that my, my eyes were opened up to the beautiful world of the undersea. And it truly was almost like going to another planet. Um, there were so, there's so much beauty and there's so much intrigue and so many things that I didn't recognize, so many foreign things. So it's it's constantly, it's an adventure around every corner down there, which is what I love. Yeah, so uh, when I was in my early 20s, <laughs> I was living in East Africa, uh, but then I was called on a mission to go uh, for a period of, I think it was four or five months on, on a ship that my father had uh, in the South Pacific called the Lindblad Explorer. And this was an expedition ship taking travelers all over the world. And, uh, and so I went, uh, went, went on that ship and then ultimately went down to the Antarctic and spent three months uh, in the Antarctic. And I, you know, I traveled a fair amount as a kid uh, to places like, uh, various parts of Africa to Egypt, uh, some other places, but I really hadn't spent a lot of time on the ocean per se, uh, except, you know, in Sweden when, you know, along the coast of Sweden when I was a, when I was a child. But what I, I, I just couldn't believe all of the things that I discovered and all of the things that I saw. I mean, in those days in particular, you know, the, there was no such thing as an unhealthy coral reef in any of these places. Uh, all of them were vibrant. The fish life was extraordinary. And, 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 you know, I'd already sort of developed a real reverence for nature in East Africa, uh, particularly as it uh, related to the time I spent with elephants. But this now extended it to the ocean and I really, really began to develop a deep appreciation. And I think it was solidified in Antarctica where, I just couldn't believe there was a place like this. I mean, I remember the first three days when we were approaching the continent, I did not go to sleep 
I just was mesmerized. I was standing most of the time on the bow of the ship, bundled up, looking off at a mountain in the distance, waiting to actually get through the pack ice and land on the continent. And that, that, that was, I'll never forget those days and, and eventually getting exhausted, but just not willing to leave and go to bed. It was that mesmerizing. All right, absolutely amazing. And I love that you both talked about diving. I've been diving since 2007. Uh, there's nothing better than gearing up and jumping into the water. Uh, before we share maybe a couple little video clips, um, can you tell us about an experience you've had underwater, maybe a shared experience that's just left a mark? <laughs> okay, I'll do this. Uh, so, so we were in, uh, this was a couple of years ago, we were in an, uh, an island called Morea. And we saw, we, we had just taken a dive. And while we were on the dive, we looked up and there was this humpback whale that looked ginormous, but in fact, we found out later on it was, it was a juvenile. And it just sort of cruised by and, and cruised over us. And I'd never seen a whale from underneath, right? Looking up from about 50 feet, looking up and this thing swimming. And then when we got to the surface, you know, we, we, we took our scuba gear off and then we saw in the distance that this whale was playing around with a bunch of people in the water, it was spy hopping and slapping its fin and, and all these people were out or surrounding it, mesmerized. And we went over there and, and, and had a look and this whale was a bit disoriented, I think. I think there were probably too many people there. And it turned around at one point and it actually, it, with, with its tail, it just grazed Kristen which by the way, can be a really bad idea if it does it too hard because this thing is like strong and big and, and solid and, and, and uh, she was a little bit taken aback, but not too, too much. But then all these people left and then we just went in the water in the hope that this whale might come back because it looked like it was very interested in, 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 in interacting. And then I'll never forget, I, you know, I, I, I was looking down and out of the depth, this guy comes up and comes up and he takes a bead straight at me and then just swerves away just within inches. And then he spent the next 40 minutes, we were just cavorting with this guy. And, and he was, he or she, I'm not sure. Is, what do you think? Is it was a male or a female? We have no idea. I don't know. I don't know. But it was, uh, it, it, we, we talk about it all the time. I mean, it, it was just the most delightful experience. I mean, we both had an opportunity subsequently to spend, you know, a little bit of time here and there with humpback whales in the, in the water, but to spend like 45 minutes of just nonstop interaction, it was just fabulous. Oh yeah, that sounds just amazing. I've been lucky enough to be that close i've seen lots of humpbacks but usually from a distance that sounds just incredible to be you know in the water kind of be one with them it's amazing um i want to pop in a quick question that just came in via youtube this is from uh make sure i get the name right there we go from kinley kinley's joining us in winnipeg manitoba so here in canada and they're curious about where you've been diving in the world have you been diving uh in all of the oceans um, gosh, well, we have dove pretty much um, many of the tropical areas. Our favorite place to dive, um, I think, is probably French Polynesia. Um, and we also uh, really love Baja, California. Diving in the Galapagos is really beautiful because of all the biomass they have down there with all of the protection efforts that have been in place. Um, also the Banda Sea, which is uh, close to Indonesia, the Banda Sea and off of West Papua New Guinea, a place called Raja Ampat. Um, that area of the world is, is known as the Coral Triangle because of the unbelievable abundance of healthy corals that they have there. That was just really beautiful to see as well. I, I have never, um, and I don't think you have either, we, we don't do um, cold water diving. Although I have so much appreciation and maybe one day I'll get up the nerve to learn how to dry suit dive and go diving in a beautiful place like the Arctic or Antarctica, that would be just amazing. Yeah. But we stick to the warm water for the most part. <laughs> Seychelles, Cuba. Seychelles, Cuba. You know, it's, yeah. it's funny when, I, when, when we're talking about this, mm -hmm. when, when 
Kristen was sort of rattling off these different places and then recognizing that there were several more that she hadn't mentioned. It, it really goes to show how much of our time together, the last five years, we've actually spent diving. In fact, I think when we, when we haven't been working, I think we've been diving yeah. pretty much all of the time. All right. Well, I'm, as a Canadian, I'm going to say I'm slightly disappointed in the lack of cold water diving. I know. I know. Yeah. You should go up to Haida Gwaii and dive. That's a beautiful place. Oh, yeah. Yeah. The, the West Coast, I'd love to. I do a lot of great lake diving. So a lot of shipwrecks uh -huh. in Lake Huron, Georgian Bay. Uh, Ooh, yeah. that's cold. <laughs> cold and murky. Don't like murky either so much. We went diving off the coast of South Carolina. Yeah, just, just off here. And out in the middle of the ocean, I, we were quite far out and there, evidently there's this sort of bit of a seamount there. And we went down a rope because you couldn't see a thing until just before we got to the bottom. So, you know, within a couple of feet and then finally we saw the bottom. Yeah. That, that was a freaky experience, but then, the, but then all of a sudden we started seeing amazing things I and mean, these enormous schools of fish and a, yeah, oh a, boy. a conch shell, which was like the, the biggest conch I've ever seen in my life. And like the conch shell enormous. That big. So there, there's something everywhere, I guess. That you all right, that's awesome. So uh, why don't we take a moment now, Kristen, I know you have some videos. Uh, why don't we take a look at some awesome places, make us feel like we can escape uh, from our homes for a little bit and then yeah, uh, I thought action. that's a great opportunity for us to take you over so um Sven's company if you if you all out there um, don't know about it it's called Limblad Expeditions and during this time when everyone has basically been um quarantined to their homes no traveling no adventuring <laughs> no diving no swimming um, they are doing virtual expeditions. So they have gotten put together a platform off of um, expeditions.com is the website. And I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. And we decided we'd take you to through two of the videos up here, but we're going to start with our, our favorite place, a location that we were actually meant to be at in a couple weeks to celebrate our wedding. But it's been postponed. So um, we're gonna take you to South Pacific and French Polynesia. And hopefully this will work. Let's see, okay. To learn a little bit more about what that area is like. Sound on, make sure your sound's on. So this is Fakarava, a place we love to go diving with the sharks. There's no narration on this? This one? That's uh That's one of our favorite places to dive called Makatea. So there's a very large manta population that we have that is just recently being discovered in part a lot to um, Sven's expeditions and the, the opportunity to go to the Marquesas. And so they've just launched a big study effort where they're going to be tagging the mantas in the Marquesas, trying to learn more about that population there. That is a place called Easter Island that you can Google and learn more about the, the famous statues of Easter Island. So that just took you um, 
to a uh, beautiful place. As I said, it's our favorite place in the world. And um, I was gonna take you, open up some photos of that um, story that Sven ta talked about when he mentioned getting in the water with whales um, and show you a few of those photos that I actually took from that time. Um, so this is, of course, the friendly juvenile whale. Um, and it's really amazing when you get up close to humpbacks, the amount of interaction they, they really love. When they're in the mood, they really love to interact and they will very curiously look at you. And so if you look right here at the eye, you can almost see the, the whale really looks, looks at you and inter interacts with you. Um, Sven, uh, I have a few photos of him photographing the whale and this gives you some good perspective, right? So the whale is coming up and really, really checking Sven out, right? Uh, on the surface as he has his camera there and, and the whale is posing. And the, these animals are so large that just with a slight flick of the tail, it would be gone. So there's no question about whether or not they really want to be interacting with you because if they did not want to be interacting, they wouldn't, they wouldn't be around. They would be gone. Mm -hmm. They'd be out of there, right? Totally. Um, and just to give you a bit of a feeling, I, I love these. Here's another good perspective photo of what it was like to have the guests sort of there witnessing this whale happened to be doing spy hopping, which is a, a form of play. They come out and you've probably seen photos where the whale's head is just popped up over the water and it's looking around. Um, and then this is one of my favorite photos because I feel like it really shows the power of, you know, that's a head on shot with this whale basically pummeling through. And you can really get a feel of, of what that feels like as it's happening. And the thing that I learned, um, the more I'm in the water with whales that really just is so, really surprising to me and inspiring also, is that the whales are so, they know how to control every little inch of their body. So they don't, they will come up and move a fin and they will come up next to you and just completely move around you. So you would think something so big, right, would be a little clunky or when they come up to small little humans that you need to be scared. You really don't, except when they're juveniles, because when they're juveniles, almost like a toddler, right? Juveniles are a little klutzy. They're, they're still learning about their bodies. They're learning about how, you know, what works and what doesn't work and how. And so that instance that Sven talked about earlier, when I was really far off actually. And the juvenile made a sweep and wasn't as, you know, because it's still learning about its body and learning about interaction with other things. It wasn't, and that's the only time I've ever, other than that in the water, it's amazing. These big animals will just like come so close to you and at the last minute, just move the arm around. So that's a really fascinating thing about humpback whales. Um, and uh, this is another one of my favorite photos from that moment. Again, you can really see the interaction in the eye. You can really see how the whale is, is almost performing. They will perform for you. They really love to, I think, show off their moves and the different things that they like to do. You'll, um, you'll notice something in a lot of those pictures that, that, that these were all taken with a, I don't know how many of you uh, are, Particularly knowledgeable about photography, but with a, with a wide angle lens, so which and and so you couldn't even get the whole whale in the picture; it was that close. So one thing we're curious about, and we I, I don't know we'll, if we'll ever find the answer, but for you guys who were who were young, you know, one of the great things about science is to try and figure out, you know, the answers to any number of questions that we have. And some of them we'll never get the answers to, and that's okay. Uh, and uh, there, there, there are so, 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 so many questions. But I'm gonna be, I would love to try and understand how these whales will react when they come back to Tahiti or come back to French Polynesia this summer, because in the winter, our winter, they, these particular whales from French Polynesia are in the Antarctic, mostly. 
So they have been leaving the Antarctic more or less now, a couple of weeks ago now, and they're heading north. Uh, and in the Antarctic, they feed incessantly. That's more or less all they do. And when they come up and they arrive in Polynesia, thousands of miles away, they're not eating anymore. Maybe opportunistic, maybe occasionally, but but they're not. That's not what they're there to do. They're there to give, to to to, to have babies, and to socialize, uh, and to relax, because this constant feeding is full of uh, uh, takes a lot of work. But also, they're so used to the fact that in that period there are people around and boats and swimmers and and all of a sudden now because of this coronavirus, depending on how long it lasts, there's not going to be any of those people because nobody's allowed to go there. And so all of a sudden these whales will arrive and they'll say, what's going on here? Where are they? Where, where, where are these? Someone will say, wow, thank God they're not there, right? Those guys drive me nuts. Some others like this guy will say, where are my play toys? I, I, I expected these, I expected, these guys to be here so I could play with them. So, and they're going to be extremely confused, I think, about what's going on. But I'd love to understand what actually goes through their brain about that. <laughs> so I thought we would uh, hop from Polynesia, because I know we don't have a ton of time, but um, and hop to one of our other favorite places in the world, well, Spens. I haven't been there. In fact, we were supposed to be there right now. We were going to be celebrating the um, inaugural launch of uh, his newest ship, which is the most advanced uh, icebreaker to hit the market. So um, he particularly loves the Arctic and I am looking forward to the opportunity to get there. And we thought we would show you this great because everyone loves polar bears, right? I mean, polar bears are awesome. So we thought we'd give you a little taste of the Arctic. <sighs> The one with Tom Ritchie speaking. Those are walrus. So these are reindeer. Real reindeer. <laughs> So, um, and Sven had a really good, uh, amazing uh, experience on a recon. What was that? A couple years ago now. Um, yeah, two years ago. We went up to uh, a place called Svalbard, and it's in the Norwegian Arctic. And we went in March, which was very early. Uh, I certainly had never been there. Uh, I, I'd been there no earlier than June in the past. And I was curious to see what it was like at this time of year. And it was the most magical experience because there's nobody up there. Uh, there's still, you know, all this snow on the mountains. There's lots of sea ice. And the light is just so beautiful. So these are just a few pictures of that experience. So this is like driving. We hired an old bucket, an old rust bucket of, a, of, a, of an icebreaker to do this trip. And, 
uh, a lot of the time we were channeling our way through sea ice. Looking for polar bears. Looking for and other things. all kinds of things, but. Uh, So they finally found the polar bears. What was it? Almost it was towards the end, right? Yeah, we found. Uh, well, we saw we saw a bunch of them, but mostly at a distance. But these guys, we found. Uh, uh, to go to the next picture because you'll, this this will just see this one here, just this how one. beautiful this part of the world is. Oh yeah. Uh, and it's just so spectacular. But polar bears are having difficulties because. This sea ice, which normally should be there until certainly into July, uh, is no longer there into July. In fact, it's mostly gone by June, even mid-May sometimes, because everything's getting warmer. And this ice is what polar bears in particular depend upon, they go out on the ice and they hunt seals from the sea ice. And if the sea ice is gone, they have to stay on land. And they, that is not nearly as good for hunting. And so in many instances, they get skinnier and skinnier because they have a harder and harder time uh, to get food. And so uh, this is a real tragedy. Uh, and if we don't figure out how to deal with global warming, it will be, the polar bears will really suffer a lot. A lot of things will, but the polar bears are a particularly good symbol for understanding the importance of ice. So we thought we would just highlight those two areas and then um, I'm sure people have a lot of questions and we can continue to expand on different things. But I think more than anything during this time as well, when we're in such isolation, um, to just continue to, to think about those times that you're gonna be back out in the field and, and those times when you are gonna get back out to exploring, when the scientists are gonna get back out to doing their work, to studying the animals and studying the environment and and when we're gonna get through this and what it's gonna look like on the other side and, and hopefully it will have inspired, you know, a renewed sense of, of purpose and a renewed sense of appreciation for the freedoms that we've had in the past of, of the movement and the travel and the opportunity to take and then share experiences like this, which are just such a blessing to inspire people to know more about the environment. Absolutely. And thank you for sharing those two, I mean, equally beautiful, but in very different ways, uh, locations on the planet and so tied to the ocean, uh, yeah. both of those spots. Uh, Kristen, if you want to hit the stop screen share at the top, we'll bring you back and then we'll start taking some questions from uh, the chat. And so I love this first one. This first one uh, kind of highlights how people feel differently about sharks. We have one person in the chat who said, oh, I want to be swimming with those sharks. We have someone else who said, why do you dive with sharks? Uh, can you tell us a little bit about, uh, you know, your experiences with sharks? Because sharks are very misunderstood. Uh, and they got a pretty bad rap. They've got a pretty bad rap, that's for sure. Yeah, bad rap. Well, you know, it's, 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 it's interesting because you're right. There's, you meet more people that are probably uncomfortable mm -hmm. with sharks than you meet people who are comfortable with them. The reality is, and this is true actually with every wild animal, they do not want to have anything to do with us. And so a predator, which a shark is, knows exactly the kinds of things it wants to eat. And human beings are not one of them. Now, every now and then something happens where they mistake a human being for a seal, let's say, mm -hmm. and there have been, and there are certain circumstances where people have obviously been bitten and in certain instances killed, but very rarely eaten because sharks don't want to eat 
you. It's like it's like uh, a kid who gets fed liver in most instances. When I, my mother gave me liver, I said, I don't want that liver. Same thing with sharks and they don't, they, they don't want to have anything to do with that. But well, you have to be respectful and you have to respect their space. And uh, there's certain things, for example, you don't want to necessarily go splashing around the water at uh, just when the sun is going down because they're they're most active, they begin to get most active and start feeding. And mm -hmm. so there's, you learn those, but you learn how to behave around animals. And then it's very rare that you have any problems. So that's my view, you wanna to add to that? Yeah, well, I think I was pretty much like everyone else, scared of sharks for most of my life and thinking that if I just stuck a toe in the water that a shark would pop up out of nowhere and <laughs> bite my foot off. Um, and truly, a lot of that comes is revolves around our, our um, kind of popular media and the movie Jaws and, you know, what's put out there. So I, I often laugh and say that poor, the poor sharks, they've had the worst PR campaign. <laughs> Um, media campaign of any animal. But um, the first opportunity that I really got, when, when I started scuba diving, I realized all of a sudden I just noticed that all these crazy divers just talk constantly about seeing sharks. It was like I was coming from this, this viewpoint of like sharks are scary and sharks are bad. And then you start hanging out with scuba divers and you just start hearing all of a sudden everyone's obsessed like did we see a shark we didn't see a shark i still haven't seen a shark and literally some of these people that i would meet ha, ha, would they dive all over the world just waiting to see a shark so i started thinking wait this is weird like on one hand everyone's so terrified they think the minute you put a toe in the water a shark's going to come out on the other hand i'm meeting all these people that literally basically travel around the world trying to find sharks like the, all they want to do is be in the water and see a shark and they can't do it and um so then so that kind of tuned me in to the fact that wait maybe sharks aren't that bad and it wasn't until we eventually made it to one of the sharkiest places in the world french polynesia it's been a shark sanctuary protected shark sanctuary since i think 2012 2011 2012 and so there are a lot of sharks. Um, and there's this one place specifically, Fakarava, which is the, which I, I'm pretty sure is, is the shot that you saw all of the um, black tip and white tip sharks in there. And it is probably one of the sharkiest places in the world um, known for, I think they've tagged 800 resident sharks in just this one little South Pass of Fakarava. And so when you go to dive there, you're literally, you drop down and you're basically in this huge kind of cave-esque area that goes through and all of the sharks are doing their lineup. You're, you kind of feel like you're going against a surf lineup, right? You're diving through and the sharks are coming through the current at you. And um, then they make their turns and they'll do it again and make their turns and do it again. And so in that opportunity, I truly was with hundreds of sharks, you know, during any of these dives, you'd be surrounded by hundreds of sharks, just looking at them, really being able to get really super close to them, see, see their features and how really rudimentary they are, how very simple their features are. Um, have them see them come and check you out and leave and realize that they're not really, they're not going after you at all. Actually, they could really, for the most part, care less about you. But of course, in times of confusion around food, that's one thing. Um, in times of breeding um, and mating times when hormones and things get very elevated, um, it's easy for sharks to kind of have confusing moments with humans. Um, so that that's basically, I guess, to sum it up, those are some opinions about sharks. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I want to take just a quick second and share my screen. One of the best experiences I ever had was in Bimini in the Ooh. Bahamas. So I, over two days, spent six hours with these great hammerheads, and it was just wow! It was mind blowing. It was, it was something to behold. These massive sharks, and you know, they were just hanging out, checking us out, swimming around. Uh, 
Nice teeth on that one. Pretty amazing. Smiling for the camera. Yeah. <laughs> Where was that? This was in Bimini. Bimini. Bahamas, yeah. Wow. The Bahamas yeah. also are a great place to go um, see sharks. Also thanks to their, largely to their protection you know, efforts. So you're going to find in these places around the world that we talk about, the places that are the healthiest are, for the most part, the places that have put protectionary measures on Yep. their waters and their fishing policies as well. That's right. Sharks are an important keystone species and a healthy ecosystem, especially in the ocean, has sharks. Absolutely. All right. So Camille has just uh, sent in a question asking about sea lions. Have you ever been in the water with sea lions? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Lots of times. <laughs> but uh, they, they are... They are just so much fun to be in the water with because they're, they're like lab labs. You know, they just love, they're highly energetic and they just love to play. And so they'll come screaming at you and then blow bubbles in your face. They'll nip at your flippers, yes. right? They'll, yes. they'll do all kinds of funny things. And, uh, <laughs> they are they're really fun. They're so like much puppies. Fun. It's like kind puppies. of like playing with, with an underwater puppy that's just like very like, doing an acrobat I mean literally these these sea lions will do acrobatics I mean almost like they're ballerinas and they're performing for you and they do all these flips and you know my favorite move is when they like they'll do a flip and they kind of do a a hold and a drop and then they you know take off I mean it's truly it's like an underwater symphony yeah. um so much fun. And it's the exact opposite of what you think. You would never imagine because when you see them outside of the ocean, and this is why when you see them not in the water, they're normally laying out, sleeping, looking like the laziest animals you could possibly ever imagine. It's because when they're in the water, they're like torpedoes constantly, mm -hmm. like just feeding and, you know, playing. And they also go very, very fast. So you do I would say time in the water with the sea lion, you know, you you definitely have to kind of get your bearings around it because these animals will torpedo themselves at you. All right. I think now would be an awesome time to talk a little bit about, um, you know, the work that, that Lex does in some of the areas uh, where you do have expedition. So, you know, uh, giving back to the community, I think is something that's so important. I think that's something that Lex does really well uh in these areas can you tell us about maybe a conservation project in one of the areas that you're particularly kind of proud of well I, yeah yeah so i mean all over the world we try and identify the different ideas that uh need support in one form or another and then what we try and do is is or, or then what we do is we get our guests interested and engaged and then we ask them for money to help support these things which they gladly give us and uh, so it, it all works very, very well. But, but, and, and there's so many different kinds of projects from, from supporting a, uh, a school system in the Galapagos Islands to, to working on uh, getting rid of uh, introduced species like rats to an island where they do damage to, to, uh, to the native populations to one project that we've been involved with for, for six years now. And, uh, that we're, you know, just have been really, really delighted to be able to give a large level of support to is it's a project called Pristine Seas together with National Geographic that identifies places in the world that have real value. Uh, then what they do is they go and they uh, study these areas to, 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 to a certain degree, document the values from those areas and then use that information that scientific information and that visual information to uh, encourage governments to protect large parts of the ocean, something called marine protected areas. And since we've been, uh, since, since the time we first started supporting them uh, up, up until now, they have managed to be at the forefront of protecting nearly 6 million square kilometers of ocean habitat and uh, that's really really important because in nature we, we sometimes or very often overuse it we fish too much we take too much uh, that can be true in the forests it can be true in the oceans you know 
and, and the best way to help nature is to leave it alone for periods where you stop taking things out of it. And that's what marine protected areas are meant to be. Places where you do not fish, you do not, uh, you do not mine, you, do not, you take nothing out of that system. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And we are lucky enough to host uh, members from the Pristine Seas expeditions whenever they're in different spots. So we've hosted them from their ships in the Azores, uh, from Colombia, uh, where else? One other spot, I'm just blanking on it right now. We get to host uh, usually That's expedition awesome. leader Paul Rose when he's out. Yes. Uh, so Paul's a great guy. And then there's so many different scientists uh, on board who can share their story. So those are a lot of fun uh, to check out. I do want to share one more time uh, in the chat bar, the link to the expeditions, the virtual expedition. So you can check out some of those videos and dive a little bit deeper uh, into Lindblad. So I just shared that as well. And I want to finish off with one more question that just came in here uh, about a place that's pretty near and dear to my heart. So another amazing Lindblad program is the Grosvenor Teacher Fellowship. Mm -hmm. And each year teachers from across North America are selected uh, to go on expedition uh, with Lindblad and then to bring that new learning back to their classrooms. And they create all kinds of programs and lesson plans. They speak to the general public. They do all kinds of amazing things. And I got to spend 10 incredible days in the Galapagos back in 2016. And this last question is about that. Um, looks like Kinley's wondering about how many islands you've been able to visit in the Galapagos. How many islands? Yeah. yeah. Oh, goodness. Uh, maybe a dozen or so different islands. Yeah. And then so you and I, Sven, we did an event a little while back uh, where you shared some pictures and stories from the Galapagos. And Kristen, have you been to the Galapagos as well? Yes, I've been with Sven. Uh, not, not quite. How many times have you been? Oh, Gosh, God, I mean, 50. Yeah, Sven's been to the Galapagos probably 50 times. He's, yeah. You've been doing work there for over 50 years. He and right. also his father, um, who did a lot of work there. I've been probably, gosh, four times. So... And just what is it uh, about those islands that just makes it so special? Because they're islands that I think a lot of people may not have heard of, um, but they definitely have a very special place in many scientists, especially evolutionary scientists' hearts. Uh, but they're just amazing set of islands. Can you tell us a little bit about them to wrap things up? Yeah, so, so the person that made uh, the Galapagos famous he wasn't that wasn't his intention necessarily but he was a guy by the name of Charles Darwin and Charles Darwin uh, noticed when he was on a world uh, around the world expedition and part of it was in the Galapagos Islands and he noticed certain things there uh, that made him think about the concept of evolution. I don't know to what degree the age group here is being taught about evolution. But so, for example, he would see that a bird, a particular kind of bird, like a finch, which is a small bird, would, from island to island, would have a different shape of beak. And they uh, were feeding on different things. So the conclusion ultimately was that, uh, that these birds had adapted and changed their shape in order to take advantage of what was available in those places to eat. And so ultimately something came out which is called the theory of evolution, which, uh, which, which, which dealt with this adaptation. And adaptation is a really important word for every student and every human being because we're constantly adapting and having to adapt to different conditions. But what makes Galapagos, Galapagos really is unique because you have so many creatures there that exist nowhere else. So for example, there was a, there's, there's an animal called an iguana, which is like a lizard, big lizard. And there are basically two kinds in the Galapagos, but they both started as being one kind. 
And then the other kind, or one of the kinds, all of a sudden decided that they liked eating seaweed. And so eventually they completely, their whole body is adapted and they are now called marine iguanas and their entire diet is underwater. And so they stay down for long periods of time and eat seaweed. Their counterpart living on certain islands is a land iguana and found it more preferable to stay on land and to feed on cacti and things of that nature. And so that's another perfect example. So the marine iguana exists nowhere in the world except the Galapagos. There's a bird called the cormorant. You all might have seen a cor cormorant. They exist all over. You can see them in Florida and here in South Carolina. But there's one particular, the, the cormorant in the Galapagos lost its wings or lost its ability to fly. So it has these little stubs of wings because it too found that it could do better in the water, in the ocean, feeding for fish, feeding that way rather than diving into the water and catching them that way. So over time, I mean, you're talking about, you know, hundreds of thousands of years, the wings just started disappearing or getting smaller and smaller and smaller because they, they became, they were not helpful any longer. So that's what fascinates people about the Galapagos so much, this, 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 this uniqueness of adaptation. Absolutely. And I'll never forget when you're on the beaches, when you're on those black volcanic rock beaches and you hear all the sneezing, all the marine iguanas sneezing, the salt uh, that kind of builds up in the gland and they get it out of their body. That's something, uh, yeah, kind of sitting around all day sneezing on each other as they warm up. Uh, yeah, that's not social distancing. No, yeah, no. They, they, they need That's to be they need, they need to be taught sneezing on each other. So. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, Sven and Kristen, I think I want to wrap things up with one question. I think it's the most important question of all is for young explorers, young conservationists, young uh, adventurers, young scientists who might tune into this event be today or tomorrow. Uh, what advice would you give uh, somebody tuning in who wanted to pursue a career in adventure and exploration and conservation? You want to say, and then I'll say uh, something as well. Well, I think that um, I think that right now this is a really that's a really good time to address that question because we're in a period that is a is a to be determined period where we cannot we're not allowed to go explore. We can't travel across boundaries. We can't you know a lot of us can't even go into nature. Um, right now. And I think that it's important to stay committed and to understand that, um, you know, knowledge and experience and being out there in the world has taught us so much about each other and about the other planets on, I mean, other animals on this planet. And so just to kind of keep your eye on the prize always and just with an eye towards, you know, that you're going to be able to get back out there and you're going to be able to go to those places. You're going to be able to see those things and um, be inspired that the scientists will get back to work and that we all can sort of mm -hmm. Yeah. really appreciate what uh, what the value the values of being able to move around the planet give to science and education and conservation i mean just being able to understand what parts mm -hmm. of the planet need more help yeah i i just like to add something which is that you know we live in an era where there are lots and lots of distractions for kids that uh, are sort of man made video games, telephones, computers, all of this. Uh, and they, they, they serve a purpose and they can also be fun. Uh, but nature is always has existed and we are recognizing more and more how important it is uh, to our survival and our happiness. And so curiosity is really the number one primary ingredient, because if you're curious, you ask questions. And if you ask questions, you discover things. And then as you discover things, you begin to think about how you may fit into doing something about the things you care about. Uh, 
So conservation is interesting because you can be everything from a lawyer because conservation needs good, smart environmental lawyers. It can be as a photographer. It can be as a scientist. It can be as a, somebody who understands data. So there's so many different ways. There's so many different uh, uh, ways a young person can engage in their concern for, for the environment based on the particular skills and the particular interests that they have. So if you're curious, you will find, you'll learn more. And as you learn more, you will want to do more. And then you will find your own path uh, that's most appropriate in terms of your character. All right, absolutely. Great piece of advice uh, from both of you. Thank you so much. First of all, I want to do a huge shout out to YouTube. Thank you so much for the groups that tuned in live today. Uh, and we're looking forward to uh, future events over the next week or two uh, as we continue to launch more on our website. And a huge thank you to both of you, uh, Kristen and Sven, not only for spending some time with us today, sharing some beautiful places on the planet, but also for your commitment, your commitment to protecting uh, these beautiful places and sharing them as well with so many people. Thank okay. you. Thanks, We're Joe. so happy to be here with all of you. <laughs> all right. Take care. Good luck and stay safe. <laughs>